So here's question six, and the first thing to note is the rubric of this question. Answer part A and either part B or part C. Now you're not going to get any extra marks by answering both parts B and C. So before you start, look through the question, decide whether you're going to get more marks on part B or part C, and just answer that part of the question. Question six is based on the infrared material that you've been studying for yourself and on the aromatic chemistry. So 6A part 1, two isomeric compounds B and C have the molecular formula C6H10O and the infrared data given below. Suggest a structure for each compound and again explaining your reasoning. Just writing down a compound, even if it's a correct answer, is not going to get you all the marks. So what do we need to do? Okay, so for compound B, we need to say what each of these stretching frequencies corresponds to. And 2940 is a CH stretch, 1716 is a CO double bond stretch, and it's typically the stretch of a ketone, and so let's draw a ketone with the correct molecular formula, it might be cyclohexanone. There are lots of other things it could be as well, always worth checking that we've got the correct molecular formula, so count up the carbon atoms, obviously six in a six-membered ring, We've got five carbons that are CH2, so that's 10 hydrogens and one oxygen. Now, if you've just drawn cyclohexanone and, and nothing else, you'll probably get one mark for that, but no more. Okay, compound C, anything that's well above 3,000 wave numbers is likely to be an OH or an NH. We've only got oxygen in this compound, no nitrogen, so it's got to be an OH stretch. 2936 is always going to be a CH stretch. And then 2228, that's in the region between the carbonyls, 1700 to 1800, and the CH stretches at around 3000. This is a typical triple bond stretching region, and it can only be a CC triple bond because we've only got carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen in there. So it's an alkyne. Okay, so now it's a case of drawing a compound with the right molecular formula. And again, there's several possibilities what it could be. There we go, that's hex. 3-ine, 1 all. Again, lots of possibilities, though, for your, for your products there. OK, 6A part 2 is about aromaticity and which of these structures are aromatic. Now, rather than looking at each structure individually, you can save yourself some time by just telling me what the criteria are for aromaticity. And, and this is Huckel's rule. So Huckel's rule states that a structure is aromatic if it's planar, cyclic, fully conjugated and has 4n plus 2 pi electrons where n is an integer, so 2 or 6 or 10 or 14 and so on. And if we look at the three structures we've got, d, e and f, we'll notice they're all planar, cyclic, fully conjugated. Again, we can save ourselves a bit of time by noting that all three fulfill three of the criteria. So all we're looking at is whether they have 4n plus 2 pi electrons. d has 4 pi electrons. From two double bonds, so is not aromatic. Compound E, which is pyrrole, has six pi electrons, but you need to tell me a bit more about why that's six. So if you just say four from two double bonds and two from the nitrogen lone pair. And so that one is aromatic. And compound F only has four pi electrons. Again, it's four from two double bonds and one vacant p orbital. And four isn't a four n plus two number, and so F is not aromatic. Part three of this question is looking at, at both aspects, the aromatic chemistry and the infrared. And again, it's important to read exactly what the question's asking you here. Just as I said earlier, you have to give all the information that the question's asking for. You won't gain any further credit for giving more information than you asked for. So this clearly says, draw the structure of the major product. It doesn't say, tell me what the mechanism is. Drawing a mechanism will not get you any extra marks in this question. So what are we doing? What do we need to know? Well, we need to know what the reagents do, bromine, 
iron 3 bromide. Okay, it's an aromatic bromination reaction. And we need to know the directing effects of this ketone group. And the ketone is metadirecting, so this is going to be the main product. What about the IR stretching frequency? Well, we could just write down a number. Okay, we might just write down 1685 wave numbers. But, I mean, this is one of these occasions where it's helpful to give a little bit of your reasoning just because it allows me to, allows the examiner to give you some credit if you don't get the right number. So you might want to write down, rather than just saying infrared stretching frequency 1685, you might say a typical ketone stretching frequency is 1715, but conjugation to the aromatic ring lowers the frequency by or typically between 15 and 40 wave numbers. So, and so a typical stretching frequency will be 1685. Okay, now in this case, all I've asked is for you to predict the IR stretching frequency. And so if you say 1685, you'll get the marks. The advantage of writing these extra couple of lines is that if, for example, if you've forgotten what the typical ketone stretching frequency is, and you think it's, I don't know, 1750 or 1800, but you can remember that it will be lowered by conjugation to the aromatic ring, again, you can get some partial credit for that. Okay, so sometimes it's worth just taking a bit of time to give a bit more explanation as to where your answers come from. Right, on to question B, part 1. Here we're being asked how the methoxy group donates electron density to the aromatic ring. And this is purely material from lecture notes. Okay, so just drawing those resonance structures will give you the marks in that part. Moving on to part two, here you are asked to draw a mechanism for the reaction of G with acetyl chloride and aluminium chloride. Indicate the major products and show how the methoxy substituent determines the regioselectivity of the reaction. Okay, so what do we need to draw here? Well, if you're asked for a mechanism, then we need some curly arrows. So there we are with the formation of the acylium ion and we can write both canonical forms. So that's the formation of the electrophile. What about the actual reaction with the anisole? Well, what we could draw here is attack of the electrophile in the ortho, meta and para positions and draw all the canonical forms for the intermediate and show that there are extra ones in the ortho and para position. But in fact, all the key information you've got, if you just focus on the main, most important canonical form, so pushing from the oxygen of the methoxy group, we get that intermediate, and then we lose a proton to give the ortho substituted product. And we can do something very similar for para substitution. So there's our intermediate, and there is the product. And you probably just want to say at the end there that substitution in the meta position does not allow stabilization of the positive charge onto the oxygen atom. And so the ortho and para products are the major products. Okay, so that would be enough on that particular question to get you the marks. And let me just reiterate again, sometimes questions will be more explicit in what they want. So sometimes you'll be asked draw out all the canonical forms of the intermediate and obviously if it asks you to do that then do that. Okay the final part is part C suggesting synthetic routes to both of these compounds starting from benzene. More than one step will be required. So let's have a look how would we approach this first one. Well perhaps it's useful in this case to start at the end because we know we want benzonitrile. We only know one way of putting a cyano group onto an aromatic ring and that's by reaction of a diazonium salt with copper cyanide. And we only know one way of making diazonium salts, and that's by reacting amino benzenes, anilines, with sodium nitrite and HCl. And in fact, we only know one way of generating amino benzenes, and that's by reduction of nitrobenzenes, either with tin HCl or with hydrogen over a palladium catalyst. 
And now we're back at nitrobenzene, and we can get that by nitrating benzene. Okay, so those four steps, all the reagents correct, will give you the four marks. What about the second one? Well, there's some other considerations here rather than just remembering what the, what the reagents are. Now we've got a dye-substituted product. And again, no harm here in, in making some annotations as to your thought process. That way, if you don't get the answer completely right, you can still get some credit. So perhaps we would start by saying that the bromine is an ortho-para-directing substituent. And in fact, the ethyl group is also an ortho-para-directing substituent. And we want them para to each other, so it's all looking good. But you'll remember we can't do Friedel-Crafts alkylation very efficiently, particularly with primary alkyl halides. And so we need to introduce this as COCH3, and that's going to be meta-directing. And that gives us some idea of what order we're going to do the steps in. So we're going to introduce the ketone group probably to the bromobenzene. But there's more than one answer here uh, that will be acceptable. So here's our starting material, benzene. Bromine, iron bromide, we'll give you this, and then we'll do a Friedel-Crafts acylation, CH3, COCl, and aluminium trichloride. Bromine is also para directing, usually the para product is the major one, so that'll put a ketone group in there, and then we need to reduce the ketone. And we do that with the Clemenson reduction, which is zinc amalgam, so zinc and mercury, and hydrochloric acid. And that will reduce the acetyl group to an ethyl group. Okay, so this is a question where all you're asked for is a synthetic route. So if you give me the reagents and they're all correct, then you'll get all the marks. But again, it's one of these places where you can sort of hedge your bets a little bit by giving some more indication of your thought processes. And as I say, that just makes it easier to give you partial credit if you don't get everything absolutely correct.